Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Vicki Hart Vascular Center Grand Rounds. My name is Ju Kim, and um, I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers today. Um, I serve as one of the uh, associate program directors for the fellowship, and therefore I have the, the honor to do so. Um, before we start, there are some housekeeping items I was asked to review. Um, we are broadcasting live via live stream and YouTube. Um, the recording will always be available for viewing in the future. And please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel to get notifications when videos are added. And for our viewers, if you'd like to submit a question, text the word DeBakey to 37607. And for those of you in the room, please use the microphones for questions. You may also submit questions via the live stream feed. Uh, find the video on livestream.com backslash HMH slash dash edu. We also have two conferences coming up um, in the month of June. Uh, from June 5th through the 7th, we have a pre-intern training for vascular residents. And then on June 17th, uh, we have a conference uh, called Cardiology for the Non-Cardiologists. So please keep an eye out for that. All right. Our first speaker is Dr. Priyanka Satish. Dr. Satish is our uh, third year of cardiology fellow. She's graduating um, at our program. She completed medical school at the Governor Stanley Medical College in India and did her internal medicine training at Case Western Reserve University Hospitals in Cleveland. She has a primary research interest in studying cardiovascular disease in South Asians and understanding the epidemiology and management of its risk factors. She studies sociocultural context underlying the heterogeneity in cardiovascular risk factors among different South Asian subgroups, and is interested in implementing programs to improve those risk factor profiles. She is also a principal investigator for a multicenter trial called MS Chat uh, that aims to train medical students in behavioral counseling. And she enjoys all aspects of clinical and preventive cardiology, and she'll be starting a prevention program at Ascension Seton in Austin. So please welcome Dr. Satish. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Can you guys hear me okay? So thank you for the opportunity to talk to you all about this topic. That's, uh, it's a topic that's very close to my heart, no pun intended there. Um, but we're talking about cardiovascular disease in the South Asian population. So who are South Asians? So these are individuals who trace their ancestries to these countries, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, and the Maldives. There are 5.4 million South Asians in the United States, and this is the fastest growing ethnic minority group in the United States. Uh, just to side note, South Asians are different than Southeast Asians, which is classically refers to uh, people from Phil uh, Philippines and Vietnam, and they're also different from East Asians, which refers to people from, for example, China, Japan. So why are we talking about cardiovascular risk in the South Asian population? Multiple cohort studies have shown a higher cardiovascular risk in this population when compared to non-Hispanic whites and other racial and ethnic subgroups. For example, this graph here on the right of the screen um, looks at data from the Kaiser Permanente cohort where they found that South Asians had a much higher incidence of coronary heart disease for both men and women uh, when compared to multiple other groups, including non-Hispanic whites, Hispanics, blacks, uh, as well as East Asian subgroups. They also have a younger age at presentation, so five to 10 years before other groups, and this risk persists even after adjusting for traditional risk factors. Once they have disease, they also have worse outcomes, so there's a lot of data on worse outcomes after, for example, acute myocardial infarction, higher uh, rates of hospitalization for ischemic heart disease. This is US mortality data. And if you look at the curves for both men and women, the mortality from coronary heart disease is reducing for multiple different uh, racial and ethnic groups. However, if you look at this green line here, you'll see that the mortality from coronary heart disease is actually rising in South Asians, both men and in women. Also importantly, uh, the burden of premature coronary heart disease is higher in this population, like we briefly alluded to. So this is data from the NHIS showing a high burden of premature coronary heart disease 
in uh, South Asians at less than 50 as well as less than 40 years old. Why is that important? Because this is a time where you have the highest productivity and this leads to morbidity at this critical time. On angiographic studies, they've also been shown to have more extensive disease, triple vessel disease, and higher percent stenosis per vessel. However, not all South Asians are the same. There are multiple different countries within the South Asian, uh, Indian, Asian Indian continent, and they have different cultures, different lifestyles, and subsequently different cardiovascular risk. So this was our data from uh, Catalonia and Spain where we showed that there's a heterogeneity in risk depending on which your country of origin. The same was shown in the UK Biobank data. Uh, you can't see the references here because of this bar, but it showed that Bangladeshis had the highest risk followed by Pakistani individuals, and Indians actually had a lower risk within this subgroup. Another study looked at the effect of your country of birth and immigration, which is important when you're considering uh, South Asians in the US. There's a lot of data looking at the effect of acculturation on risk. There's data on racial discrimination and how that impacts CV risk factors. And there's also um, data on the duration of immigration uh, and how the integration affects cardiovascular risk. For example, despite you know, racial discrimination affecting cardiovascular risk, so people who move to, for example, the United States might start assimilating the culture of starting to exercise more. So how does the balance of all that play out? Uh, it's complicated, but this study looked at mortality from heart disease among US-born versus foreign-born individuals. And they found that foreign-born individuals, both men and women, had a higher mortality from heart disease. Another study looked at immigrants from different countries to Canada and they found that those from South, South Asian countries had much higher incidence of cardiovascular events compared to immigrants from Eastern Europe, from the United States, Western Europe, and East Asia, and compared to long-term residents of Canada. So now that we've talked about cardiovascular risk, we need to take a step further and look at what causes this increased risk. So I told you in the first slide that some of this risk persists even after adjusting for traditional risk factors. However, it's important to note that traditional risk factors still account for a large proportion of the risk. Looking at diabetes, which is of course the most you know, common and well-known risk factor in South Asians, the risk is two to four times higher than that of non-Hispanic whites. Um, if you look at this graph on the right, you'll see a younger age of onset among Asian Indians, um, which is about 45 as opposed to in the 50s for other racial and ethnic groups. It's important to note that this increased risk exists even after you adjust for risk factors and after you adjust for BMI. And there are two distinct subtypes that were shown in a novel study in India. The insulin resistant subtype is the one that we commonly think about. However, uh, South Asians also have an insulin deficient phenotype where they have abnormalities in beta cell function. And another important thing to note is that they have the highest rates of gestational diabetes uh, at, during pregnancy of multiple racial and ethnic groups. So if you have a South Asian uh, female patient, that's important history that you need to ask. Let's talk about visceral adiposity, yet another important risk factor. So in 2004, uh, doctors Yajnik and Yudkin wrote a letter to the editor um, to of Lancet. And these were two doctors in the UK. Dr. Yajnik on the right here is a South Asian doctor, Yudka, Dr. Yudkin is a Caucasian doctor. And they both have the same BMI, as you can see up top here, hopefully it's projecting. But when they do DEXA scans, you find that Dr. Yajnik, who's South Asian, has a much higher body fat percent when compared to Dr. Yudkin. So 21% versus 9%. And this has been shown in multiple other studies, leading to what's called the thin fat phenotype, where uh, South Asians have sarcopenia with low muscle mass. However, they have a high percentage of fat in all the wrong places. So body fat, liver fat, visceral fat, and this correlates with both diabetes as well as cardiovascular risk. And looking at BMI, we now know that BMI is not a great tool to screen for adiposity. 
However, this circumference is a better tool. And you'll notice here that the cutoffs are a little different in South Asian, so it's 90 and 80, as opposed to 102 and 88 in uh, other racial ethnic groups. And because of this, multiple national guidelines have also recommended different cutoffs for, uh, for obesity, overweight and obesity in South Asians. So the uh, cutoff for overweight is actually 23, and obesity is 27.5. So this is lower cutoffs than in other racial and ethnic groups. And you screen for diabetes at 23 in this population. What about dyslipidemia? South Asians have a pattern of atherogenic dyslipidemia that's commonly seen in patients with insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. So this includes uh, high triglycerides, high ApoB levels, even if the LDL-C level is the same as in other populations, they have smaller LDL particles, therefore ApoB is higher, and we know ApoB correlates with risk. They have low HDL-C, that's pretty commonly seen, and even HDL particles that exist tend to be dysfunctional and do not participate effectively in re reverse cholesterol transport. And we're now recognizing that they have higher levels of LP little a as compared to other racial and ethnic groups. And this seems to correlate with uh, outcomes in coronary heart disease risk as well. So the National Lipid Association came up with these guidelines on LDL levels for South Asians. You'll notice here that there's no recommendations on low or moderate risk South Asians. So we'd right off the bat, we start with high risk group and recommend an LDL less than 70 However, we don't just stop there. So the NLA recommends going to 50 for very high risk and even 30 for the extreme high risk group. What about hypertension? So another important risk factor, you see a lot of premature burden of hypertension in the population. And if you look at the graph here, this is the dark green looks at normal and underweight individuals, and they have similar rates of hypertension as non-Hispanic whites who are overweight or obese. And that's again another, um, you see the same thing over and again where visceral adiposity leads to multiple different risk factors at lower BMI cutoffs when compared to other individuals. And this, we think, contributes to cardiovascular risk. What about other risk factors? We talked about a lot of traditional risk factors, but that's not where it ends. Uh, we all know about the South Asian diet. We've, we've all eaten at Indian restaurants, and we like the flavorful food. However, it's high in saturated fat. It can be uh, cooked with, high, with a lot of saturated fat, cooked with high heat, uh, high carbohydrate foods. These can contribute to risk, and these are things that are useful to know about when you're counseling your patients. Uh, and you can suggest minor substitutions. Uh, physical inactivity, uh, it, it has been shown that South Asians have the lowest level of physical activity of multiple racial ethnic subgroups, um, and the reasons for that are complex. And another important one is tobacco use. So if you look at all the survey data, you'll find that South Asians report a lower rate of tobacco use when compared to other racial ethnic groups in US and Europe. However, a lot of these surveys don't capture smokeless tobacco, which is an important cultural form of tobacco. So if you're assessing your patients for tobacco use, don't forget to ask about cultural forms of smokeless tobacco. So now that we've talked about all these different risk factors, what, what can you do for these patients? What do you do differently? Looking at risk stratification, it's sort of the bedrock of what we do in trying to predict who's going to have an event and who's not going to have an event and who we can reduce that event risk in. Uh, multiple risk calculators have taken a jab at this. So the pool cohort equations, uh, the score risk, JBS3, Q risk, all of this is, some of these are in the UK. The pool cohort is, of course, in the US. If you look at the middle column, you'll see that they have a very low representation of South Asian individuals um, in the derivation cohort. And subsequently, what we can infer from them can be limited. So the, pool, the national guidelines in the US recommend just adding South Asian ethnicity as a risk enhancer to the pool cohort equation number that you get. Um, for example, the UK score, JBS, QRISC, they all have a multiplicative factor that you can introduce into your calculator. And that 
uh, allows you to sort of increase the risk in the South Asian population and increase the num predicted number that you're getting. So for example, that's somewhere between 1.3 and 1.7 in most of these calculators. So how do these calculators actually do in predicting events? It turns out not so well. So this is data from the UK Biobank. Again, this is a paper in the circulation. You can't see the reference here. But um, it showed that South Asians had a much higher incidence of ASCVD when compared to the European population. And if you look at the pool cohort and the QRS calculators, the curves seem to overlap with the European curves meaning that these calculators are not really predicting the risk that is seen in these populations. So what can you do when you have such a scenario where your risk calculators are not accurate? Thanks to Dr. Nasser, every fellow in this program is now familiar with coronary artery calcium score. And there are some data from the Masala study looking at coronary artery calcium scores. So what is the Masala study? The Masala study uh, looked at 900 predominantly Asian Indian individuals in Chicago and Bay Area. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to look at a bunch of different risk factors, the traditional risk factors and some non-traditional ones, social cultural risk factors, and trying to see if that will predict cardiovascular events. And thanks to the, these investigators, we're getting a wealth of data on this population. So this, uh, this paper, which Dr. Nasser was a part of, looked at different quartiles of pool cohort risk and looked at calcium scores in these different quartiles. So if you look at low, borderline, intermediate, and high risk, the pool cohort equations do pretty well at the low risk and the high risk populations. So in the low risk, 83% had a calcium of zero, which is great, so it predicted uh, their risk to be low. In the high risk, 60% had a very high calcium score. So again, it did pretty well in predicting the risk. However, if you look at the borderline and intermediate risk, that's where you see some discrepancy. Now, the borderline risk, 54% had a calcium of zero. And in the intermediate risk, 30% had a calcium of zero. So these are patients where we consider them to be at a higher risk and appropriate for statins and other therapies. However, they may, not, they may be at a lower risk and calcium can help detect that risk and describe it further. Let's look at the flip side. On the low risk predicted group, you see 17% had calcium. So if you went by only the pool cohort equations, you would miss 17% of the population who would benefit from preventive therapies. And while I mentioned calcium score, I thought this was interesting. The Masala data actually shows that calcium score in uh, South Asians happens to be similar to that of non-Hispanic whites. So I was trying to reconcile how do you explain the increased rates of cardiovascular events and increased mortality with similar atherosclerotic burden. And you have different theories. Maybe there's differences in plaque composition or vulnerability. Maybe there's a higher propensity for thrombosis. Or maybe it's just differences in health-seeking behavior. We know that South Asians tend to seek care later for, uh, for example, acute MI. And, and it's important to note that Masala doesn't have outcome data yet. We don't know yet how calcium score correlates with events in this population. So once the event data accumulates in the Masala study, we'll be able to uh, ha get some of those answers. And I think that's going to be important. So what do we do right now for our South Asian patients in our clinics? So uh, these recommendations are from our recent uh, paper, which is an expert recommendation in Jack Advances, uh, where we talk about what you can do right now with the data we have for your South Asian patients. The first thing is to inquire about country of origin, length of residency in the foreign country. Why does that matter? Because we just talked about how there's a heterogeneity in risk. The second is to assess key risk factors and to remember that you start early in this population. You don't wait until 40 to start assessing risk factors. You don't wait until a BMI of 25 to start assessing for risk factors. We talked about a lot of different risk factors, some of the common ones being diabetes, visceral adiposities. Uh, don't forget to measure waist circumference. We all check for hypertension. We all check lipid panels. Remember that some of it can be misleading if you're only looking at LDLC levels. Um, don't forget to assess for gestation diabetes. 
And then you can do a risk assessment with pool cohort equations. The guidelines do recommend uh, using that and adding South Asian ethnicity as a risk enhancer or QRISC-3 where you use a multiplicative factor. There are some studies which look at QRISC-3 and have found that it does not a bad job in predicting risk. And if you're still unsure, you can use coronary artery calcium score, especially in the borderline and intermediate risk based on some of the data we just saw. And if, you're, if you have a strong family history in a low risk individual, that's another place where a coronary artery calcium score can help equalize. And if available, refer to a South Asian cardiovascular and metabolic specialty program. And don't forget that culturally sensitive advice matters. So any advice you give your patient Remember to ask about barriers to following that advice. Let's take exercise as an example. The traditional construct of exercise, like going to the gym a couple times a week, does not necessarily resonate with South Asian individuals. They do not identify with these Western forms of exercise. Some women may not be comfortable exercising in mixed sex settings, so that's something to take into consideration. Uh, time, you'll find time barriers, logistics, financial barriers. Those are all important things to consider in your South Asian patients and, to be honest, in any other patient. Um, this is a resource from, uh, that has a lot of dietary recommendations for South Asian patients. Um, you can't see the ref reference here again, I'm sorry, but it gives you a lot of tailored recommendations of, for diet in this population. And as you know, ask, you know, dietary recommendations need to be tailored to what they're already eating. You can make minor changes in the food that people are eating and make it healthier, but it's hard to completely flip over and start eating a new kind of diet. Fortunately, there's a lot of different groups that are interested in this and a lot of uh, research going on looking at what are the genetic factors that might contribute to risk, how do novel risk factors play into this, looking at risk assessment, looking at second generation South Asians, which uh, we really don't have much data on, and looking at can we do something to address the social and cultural factors that are affecting risk. But as with any preventive intervention, implementation is key. So that's, that's important, and that's why there are multiple South Asian-specific clinics that are coming up across the country. We have a couple in Bay Area, Chicago, New York, uh, Dallas, that are, that are catering to this population and uh, have providers that can provide culturally competent care. Also important is community partnerships. So this is a group in Dallas that's gone out to their community in um, community and help them, you know, get into a 5K race this mo uh, in this picture. Um, Houston has a large community, so a lot of potential to do some work like that. And it was also good to see that uh, at ACC this was being addressed. They usually have one session on South Asian CVD, the years that I've gone. And it's good to see that uh, education of healthcare professionals in the nuances of this care is being performed, and that can certainly improve uh, the way we care for our patients. With that, I would like to thank you all for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions from the Priyanka, thank you so much for a wonderful tour and uh, congratulations on what you have done and uh, best wishes for the next step in setting up a prevention program. So you talked about implementation. Where, where are your thoughts and challenges from a healthcare system to initiate and build a South Asian focused CBD prevention initiative? And what can we do to address that? Uh, I think that's a great question with, um, with a lot of history, Dr. Nasser. Um, it, it seems that from a health system standpoint, it's tough to focus on one subgroup where you f almost feel like you're excluding other subgroups. In, I, I will say it is important for us to assess and risk in every ethnic subgroup where the risk is higher. But if you start looking at risk of premature cardiovascular disease, um, the risk and burden that you see in the South Asian population, really you don't see that in too many other uh, subgroups. So if you're starting to address premature CVD and you want to focus on that, I think uh, the, the population that you start targeting ends up being predominantly South Asian. 
So that's, I think, one way in which health systems can look at this and um, think about this. Through health systems as, in, as general, we talked about developing you know, South Asian competent clinics where you have providers that are uh, competent providing such care. Representation, of course, matters. And in cardiology, we're actually doing a pretty good job of this, um, where a lot of uh, cardiologists are from South Asian ethnicity. So representation definitely matters there. And buy-in from leadership, buy-in from uh, governmental agencies. There's actually a bill that's been passed in the House that uh, looks at South Asian awareness and research for South Asian health. So I think these are all steps in the right direction uh, for this population. Uh, great talk. <coughs> I, uh, so I'm sorry I missed uh, half of your talk, uh, the early uh, half, but you may have addressed this. But you know, given this high-risk cohort, uh, you know, what are the implications for a, you know, again, Dr. Nasser is also here, but what is the implication for a calcium score of zero in this population? Say you have a 40-year-old South, South Asian guy, you know, who has an LDL of 120, uh, has some family history, and uh, calcium score is zero. Uh, what are the implications for this, for this particular individual over the next 15, 20 years? I wish I could tell you. We, we are seriously lacking in outcome and event data and correlation with calcium score. Um, it, it, it's possible that like in other cohorts where they have similar calcium scores to non-Hispanic whites, but they still have other higher events, it's possible that once you develop calcium, your event rate is the same as any other group. But until we get data, event data, I think that's a tough question, and that is the golden question. I think Dr. Nasser has a comment. Sachin, repeat it in three years. <laughs> Priyanka, you, you alluded to one aspect um, in terms of the data on second generations, right? So there are first generation immigrants who are, again, born in that country, may have immigrated. Uh, born in that country and, and live there. There's guys like me who are born in another country and immigrate and basically grew up here. And then there's a the second generation. So is there, are there differences that you've noted in say the South Asian population in terms of immigrants? You alluded to a little bit earlier. Or if there isn't enough data, how would you actually tease out the different sort of um, mortality events or CVD sort of, uh, you know, risk? between first generation, second generation, and maybe even the straddlers like me, you know, or the 1.5 generation? Um, there, there are some data from the Masala study that as, you know, with longer time of residence in the US and more acculturation, which they look at by a complex metric, you start to see differences in risk factors between the groups, and you start to see that they adopt more of the lifestyle that's seen in the US population. So they start maybe exercising more, they start eating less saturated fat, less high heated oil cooking foods. But um, the Masala 2G is actually looking at second generation immigrants separately and looking at their events. So a comparison between the two, I think, will give us some useful insights on how, um, how immigration and how assimilation affects this uh, risk. So it's on the way. Any other questions for Dr. Satish? Outstanding presentation, uh, Dr. Satish, great work. Um, what advice do you have for cardiologists who are seeing South Asian patients in terms of history taking specific assessment of certain risk factors to make sure they're providing culturally competent care to these patients? Um, I think you know some of the risk factors we talked about, um, it's important to uh, check a waist circumference because BMI does not give you the full story, especially in this population, but really even in other populations. Um, so that's important. Gestation diabetes is an important one. Family history can be an important one. Those, there are data showing of family history, cardiovascular disease with uh, greater correlation than even in other ethnicities. So family history is an important one. I would say, and then, and then really just coming from a place of trying to understand, because 
I think it's difficult to understand the entirety of South Asian culture if you're not from there, but really just trying to understand what are their barriers, what, what can you do, and if you have the availability, refer them to a, you know, a dietitian who is uh, familiar with this literature and can provide advice that's uh, concordant with what they're able to do. Otherwise, you're just gonna get a head nod and they're gonna do what they do all, all the time. Sorry, I still can't get rid of the bar. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> our, our next speaker is Dr. Sumit Pandat. Um, Sumit's a, a third year fellow and one of our chief fellows this year. And um, he's originally from Arkansas, but went to uh, Case Western Reserve for undergrad and did his medical school at the University of Arkansas. Um, then went to LA at Cedar sinai to do his internal medicine training before um, ultimately joining us here for cardiology fellowship. And again, he's one of our uh, not only a graduating fellow, but one of our chief fellows um, who's moving on to elective physiology next year, thankfully, here at Methodist. Um, his primary research interest is improving the risk prediction of ventricular arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death. And he's also interested in novel technologies for secondary prevention of lethal arrhythmias. And so Samit's gonna tell us about sudden cardiac death. All right, uh, thank you for that introduction, Dr. Kim. Um, so yeah, today I wanted to talk to you guys about sudden cardiac death. Um, this is a topic that's been near and dear to me for quite some time and, you know, I hope to prevent a lot of in a future practice in EP. Um, and so in recent years, sudden cardiac death has gotten a lot of attention in the media. Many of you may remember what happened to Danish soccer player Christian Eriksson back in 2021 when during a game against Finland, he suddenly collapsed to the ground, he had to get resuscitated and he was found to be in V-fib and shocked. Fortunately, he made a full recovery and he now has an ICD and is back to play. And then more recently, uh, this past January, um, the safety for the Buffalo Bills, DeMar Hamlin, he got tackled during a game. And then afterwards, he collapsed uh, down to the ground and he was in cardiac arrest as well. He fortunately made a full recovery and actually just last week, he announced that he uh, plans to return to play and the most likely diagnosis for him was commotion cortis. Um, and so, you know, these, these two individuals are extremely lucky in that they made a full recovery, but as cardiologists, we knew all too well that isn't the case for most of our patients. For the ones who often do survive, they're left with, you know, a lot of permanent neurologic disability and morbidity. And we're often left wondering, you know, what could we have done to potentially see this coming and how could we have prevented it? So sudden cardiac death, you know, is still a major public health burden. Um, in the U.S., the incidence is estimated between 180,000 to 450,000 cases every year. Um, we know that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death and it has been for quite some time. And sudden cardiac death has been attributed to 50% of that. In the U.S., this corresponds to about 7 to 18% of all deaths and worldwide about 4 to 5 million cases annually. Temporally speaking, you know, we have done better. Um, if you look at data from Framingham, we, when, you know, coronary heart disease was extremely high and has improved with, you know, therapies for coronary heart disease, such as uh, lytics, PCI, secondary prevention, medical, uh, primary prevention. Um, sudden cardiac death has also improved pretty significantly. It went from about 200 cases per 100,000 person years to now around, to around 100 in the 1990s. And then when you look at more recent data, it seems to have plateaued. This is data from Europe. We'll get four different registries of sudden cardiac death. And for them, it was around 39 cases per 100,000 person years. And it's pretty similar here in the U.S., around 40-ish. So we've, we've kind of leveled out in terms of improving sudden cardiac death from that standpoint. And so first and foremost, how do we define sudden cardiac death? Um, this has been a little bit of some controversy, but um, back in 1985, there was a WHO scientific group that got together to talk about sudden cardiac death. And in the literature, this is gen the generally most cited definition is an unexpected death or arrest from a cardiovascular cause. When it's witnessed, it typically occurs within one hour of symptom onset. If it's unwitnessed, the individual was observed to be alive within the previous 24 hours doesn't encompass non-cardiac causes such as sepsis, stroke, PE. Um, it can be described as a sudden cardiac arrest or an aborted SCD when it's terminated by an intervention such as defibrillation or it just spontaneously reverts. Um, sudden arrhythmic death is generally a more specific term, but it's used pretty synonymously with SCD. So in terms of the definition, this was a fairly recent study from 2018. 
out of the uh, post-SCD study in San Francisco where they adjudicated sudden cardiac death with autopsy data. Um, basically, these were all individuals who were meeting that WHO definition for sudden cardiac death, um, and they, they basically looked at what was their true cause of death by autopsy. And so they found that in about 56% of cases, it, it was actually an you know, arrhythmic death, but the 40% of them were actually not cardiac in etiology at all. 4% were cardiac, but not arrhythmic. And so I think this study really speaks to the difficulty of studying something like sudden cardiac death, just because that this, this definition that we have is, you know, it's fairly broad and, you know, it can lead to inclusion of a lot of not true cardiac arrhythmic death. Um, but it, narrowing the definition has been proposed and, you know, the concern is about losing sensitivity if we do so. So when it comes to the etiologies of sudden cardiac death, we know that there's many, many different mechanisms um, that can cause it. Um, and I like this figure in particular because it kind of shows that, you know, it's all a spectrum. Um, the, the potential causes that you're at risk for really varies by age, gender, ethnicity. But generally speaking, coronary heart disease has been attributed in the vast majority of cases, about 75% in Western countries. This is followed by cardiomyopathies in about 10 to 15% of cases, inherited arrhythmias in, you know, 1 to 2%, and then valvular heart disease in about 1 to 5%. This part right here kind of really emphasizes how it varies with age. So those who are younger than 35 having sudden cardiac death, it's generally gonna be more of those inherited type causes such as the arrhythmias and inherited cardiomyopathies. Whereas if they're older than 35, it's gonna be more of acquired disease like coronary heart disease and valvular heart disease. Now, looking at the actual arrhythmic mechanisms of sudden cardiac death, um, I like, this is a figure that's a bit older from 1989 from a study from uh, Dr. Kumal's group in Paris, where they basically had 157 patients who died at the time of wearing a halter, and they basically looked at what were their tracings during those deaths and what were the mechanisms. So they found that the vast majority were actually VT, about 62%, followed by bradyarrhythmias, torsades, and then primary VF. And then when you look at more modern data, this is a study by Dr. Christine Albert using data from the Nurses Health Cohort study, the vast majority now is actually more VF, and VT tends to make up the minority. And I think that's, that's partially reflective probably of, you know, improvement of our management of things like heart failure and coronary artery disease. So in terms of therapies for primary prevention, we're lucky in that we have actually a pretty definitive therapy that can abort a sudden cardiac death. Um, the first ICD was implanted back in 1980 by Dr. Murawski in uh, Baltimore. And in the 1990s, a lot of effort was made to prevent sudden death in post-MI and HEFREF patients. So we've had major trials such as MUST, MATA2, SCUD-HEF that really paved the way for primary prevention ICDs in ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And if you go to the guidelines, th these are pretty much the main things for, of which to go off of for primary prevention. We know that in ischemics, it's an EF of less than 35%, 40 days post-MI, 90 days post-revascularization, and NYJ2 or 3. If they have an EF of 30 or less, they're allowed to be NYJ1. If they have an EF that's more mid-range, 35 to 40, um, they have to be having NSVT and be inducible for VT or VF on an EP study. If they're non-ischemic, it's pretty similar, EF less than 35, NYJ2 or 3. And that's pretty much where it stops with primary prevention. There are guidelines for more disease-specific conditions like HCM and ARVC, but in terms of true primary prevention, this is kind of what we're left with. So this, this leaves a pretty significant gap in terms of SCD prediction. When you look at the data of you know, what the ejection fraction is for the SCD cases, it's actually a minority that have that severely reduced EF less than 35%, and uh, almost half of them are an EF that's normal. And when you look at it in terms of a population level, you know, we know that these patients with low EFs are at high risk as, as well as cardiac arrest survivors and those with arrhythmia risk markers, but they generally make up a lower portion of the absolute events happening. The, the highest portion of absolute events are happening in the general population with sudden cardiac death. So there's this need to improve risk prediction because this, this current paradigm is only really qualifying about a third of SCD cases for an ICD. And there's data that, you know, those who get primary prevention ICDs have, you know, appropriate therapies and less than 10% of implants. Um, so there's really this urgent need to pr improve prediction because the majority of SCDs incurring in lower risk patients. So strategies to improve prediction, these are just some of the things that have been proposed in the literature. So one is, you know, increased emphasis on identifying arrhythmic substrate that would truly lead to an arrhythmic death. Um, this is, you know, utilizing tools like the ECG and CMR better. Um, enriching risk, risk prediction scores um, from multiple modalities. This can utilize things like the echo, coronary artery calcium score, and integrating newer tools, things like genomics and AI machine learning. So the ECG, as we all know all too well, is one of our most cost-effective screening tools in cardiology. 
It really has this potential for early identification of inherited arrhythmias, identifying markers of undiagnosed structural heart disease, and detecting the more subtle abnormalities in depolarization, repolarization, autonomic function. So this is one particular study I wanted to highlight, and you can't really see the citation below, but it's by Dr. Appa Aro in Finland, um, where they basically looked at six different ECG markers um, that have all been associated with sudden cardiac death. And there's even more that they didn't include, like fractionated QRS and intrinsicoid delayed deflection. Um, but basically, these, these six markers have all been associated. And just to briefly go over them, uh, one being a heart rate greater than 75, reflective of uh, reflective of high sympathetic tone, a QRS transition over V4, reflecting an abnormal axis of activation, LVH, a QRS T angle, basically meaning you know you have an abnormal axis from the QRS versus the T wave, long QTC, and then a T peak to TN time greater than 89, basically meaning a long time in repolarization. So they looked at you know these individual markers through the organ sudden unexpected death study. Basically, they found all of them to be significant predictors of sudden cardiac death. The ones that were strongest were heart rate greater than 75 and prolonged QTC. And so they then combined these into a risk score. So basically grading if they had a score of zero, one, two, three, four, you'd see a stepwise increase in them making up the proportion of sudden cardiac death cases when they had a score greater than four. Um, and then they looked at odds ratios. Those who had a score greater than four had an odds ratio of like 21 for sudden cardiac death. They then sub substudied this based on patients who had an EF greater than 35%, and it was even more significant with an odds ratio of 26.1. And then they did an external validation of this score using the ERIC study, um, atherosclerosis risk in communities, where basically they looked at SCD incidents based on these risk scores and found that it was highest in those with a score greater than four. So moving on, another modality I want to talk about, uh, coronary artery calcium score. We're lucky to have Dr. Nasser here, who's a big advocate for this. And so it's, it's been established as a predictor of future CV events and can be an indicator for secondary prevention in asymptomatic patients. And like I showed, coronary artery disease has been attributed in the majority of SCD cases. So CACS really has this potential to identify asymptomatic CAD and serve as a potential predictor of future SCD risk. So this is a study Dr. Nasser was part of, basically through the CAC consortium, where they looked at SCD event rates based on CAC burden. And not surprisingly, those who had a high CAC score greater than 1,000 had the highest event rates for um, SCD. And those with uh, the highest uh, CACs also had the lowest event, uh, probability of uh, surviving. And so they also looked at this based on their ASCVD risk score. And this was probably the most interesting part of the study, I think, was that those who had an ACV risk score less than 7.5, relatively low risk, they had the highest odds ratio of, with a CAC greater than 1,000 compared to those who had an ACV risk score greater than 20% with an odds ratio of 3.6. So it might be more reflective of these patients who have multiple risk factors already, might not necessarily be as useful, but at least in those who are uh, conceptually lower risk, a calcium score might be especially useful. So um, one thing that, you know, a tool that we definitely make a lot of use of here at Methodist is the echocardiogram. We're lucky in that we have a lot of thought leaders in echo. And so echo is likely our most utilized screening tool right now as it's, you know, identifying our highest risk subgroup with those with an EF less than 35%. It can lead us towards a diagnosis of high SCD risk conditions such as HCM, ARVC, ASMVP. And there's many potential novel SCD predictors out there um, such as eccentric hypertrophy, RV dysfunction, and LA volume. So one particular study I want to share is one that I was a part of uh, when I was a resident at Cedar sinai And so this is data through the Oregon Sun Expected Death Study, where we basically looked at RV dysfunction as a protect potential predictor. So we looked at measures of RV size, such as basal diameter and diastolic area. We also looked at RV systolic function as the RV fractional area change. And so we compared those between SCD cases and controls. Um, basically, in SCD cases, they tended to have larger RVs. They also tended to have a lower RV fractional area change. And they had more patients uh, with a reduced fractional area change, though this wasn't statistically significant. When we did a multivariate analysis looking at increase in end diastolic area versus a 5% drop in fractional area change, the 5% drop in fractional area change was a significant predictor, though fairly modest with an odds ratio of 1.14. And then we looked at the combined effect. If we incorporated a low fractional area change less than 35% with an LVF less than 35% in a multivariate model, when patients have both, they were actually a significant predictor of sudden cardiac death compared to neither alone was sufficient. So looking more comprehensively at the echo, 
This is a study of uh, basically the ERIC group as well as the CHS group, where they look at basically very standard things we get from an echo, like mitral calcification, left atrial diameter, et cetera. And they basically tried to see if we, which of these may be significant, if we combine them together, how much would improve uh, potential risk prediction. So the things that they found significant were MAC, um, reduced LVF, not surprisingly, um, LV mass index, as well as EDA ratios when it was low and when it was high. And so they compared this to the Framingham risk score in a multivariate analysis, which that had a baseline C, C statistic of 0.608. And then when they combined all these things together, it significantly improved your C statistics to 0.764. Moving on to cardiac MRI. Um, so we know this is a powerful tool for tissue level substrate identification. It provides us with accurate and reproducible quantification of systolic functions. So especially it can be useful making sure you have a true low LVF. Um, but really the, the most valuable thing I think with arrhythmia is going to be providing scar characterization. It can you know, tell us about transmurality, the extent of scar, if there's heterogeneity. Um, currently late gadolinium enhancement, enhancement is really the most utilized mean for scar assessment. But there's growing evidence that other parts of the cardiac MRI such as T1 mapping and ECV may be useful in SCD risk evaluation as well. So this study I want to highlight, this is one looking at dilated cardiomyopathy patients who all had LG and cardiac MRI, and basically comparing their different LG patterns in terms of how it predicted SCD events. They categorized the amount of LG as being between zero and 2.55, 2.55 to five, and then greater than five. And you know, what, what was interesting was that you kind of see that it levels off once they get behind, beyond five. You, there's not that much more incremental risk to having more LGE. Um, when they looked at patterns, they found that septal LGE was the more predictive of sudden cardiac death. When they looked at where in the wall, if it was mid-wall versus subepicardial, subepicardial was worse. And if it was focal versus multiple, you'd see multiple sites of LGE was worse. And so I think this really speaks to the difficulty of using LGE right now as a potential predictor, predictor of sudden cardiac death, because not all, G, not all LGE is the same, and it's not going to be likely as simple as more LGE, more risk. It's going to be a lot more nuanced looking at things like the extent, the heterogeneity, if there's a lot of gray zone, and how we can incorporate all those things to really predict. So one other important aspect of sudden cardiac death, I think, is going to be genomics. Um, as we know that things like inherited arrhythmia sy syndromes have a genetic underlying cause, as well as coronary artery disease has many potential genes that have been implicated. So back in 2020, there was this genome-wide polygenic score developed for CAD that was published and shown to be a pretty uh, strong predictor of future development of CAD. And so this was basically based on looking at 6.6 .6 million different variants in the genome. Um, ma mainly SNPs, and so they used patients who were in this uh, registry of SCD where they were, had coronary artery disease and kind of a mid-range EF greater than 30 percent, below 50 percent, and uh, this score was evaluated mainly in uh, European ancestry, so they picked the European ancestry patients. They applied the polygenic risk score to them, and they had 13.8 percent of patients in the top decile of the score. And then they looked at sudden arrhythmic death outcomes. So basically patients who had the, who were in the top decile score tended to have the highest incidence of SCD around 8% compared to those who weren't in the top decile. It's more around 4%. This was a significant predictor. What was really interesting about the study is they also looked at non-arrhythmic deaths, so basically other causes. And it was actually lower when they were in the top decile score. And when you looked at relative risk ratios, the hazard ratio for sudden arrhythmic death was 1.77. For non-arrhythmic death was 1.0. So it's actually uh, fairly interesting that this was looked at basically as being a predictor more specific to arrhythmic death and not, look, not being associated also with competing causes of death. Um, and then one last thing I want to talk about is also utilizing AI in sudden cardiac death risk prediction. We had this really amazing grand rounds a few weeks ago by Dr. Friedman with all the potential that the ECG has in terms of predicting various conditions. And I think for sudden cardiac death, it's going to be no different. Um, so this was a study out of Korea, basically using two hospitals, um, electrocardiograms. They looked at ECGs on inpatients who had cardiac arrest, and they used the ECGs that were within 24 hours of the cardiac arrest. So it was, it was a massive amount of data from what they had was every single ECG could provide 48,000 points of data. And so they ended up having 32,000 ECGs for algorithm development, 337 of which were labeled as a cardiac arrest within 24 hours. They then did an internal validation using another 4,000 ECGs, 77 of which were cardiac arrest. And then they also externally validated this in another hospital where they had 10,000 uh, ECGs, uh, 90 of which were cardiac arrest. And so they did this um, using this blockchain um, algorithm development through deep learning. 
And so when you look at the deep learning algorithm models, um, it performed fairly well. So when they did the algorithm using 12 leads, they had an AUC of 0.913. And they looked at also with six leads and single leads, even a lead one or lead two all had an AUC of about 0 0.898, 0 0.887. So pretty, pretty impressively predictive. Um, and that was on their internal validation. On the external validation, it performed even better um, with, the, with the 12 lead 0.948 for the AUC and with the single leads around 0.92. Um, and so uh, one of the Achilles heels of AI that everyone talks about is that you can't necessarily understand these relationships that it's coming up with. Um, one thing they did to kind of help elucidate that was this uh, sensitivity analysis, where basically they look at what parts of the data is the, the algorithm making most use of. And so with this, you could see these areas in bright orange are basically that, and not surprisingly, it tended to be the QRS and the T wave that the algorithm was using the most. Uh, lastly, one thing I want to talk about is this concept of a comprehensive risk score. Because um, you know, we went through multiple different ways in which we can uh, predict risk, but the idea is that you really need to combine all these things together to get a true risk prediction. And so this is a fairly recent study last year from Dr. Chuk, one of my mentors, Sears, in this. And so he basically used data from the Oregon Suds as well as Ventura Presto study of sudden cardiac death. And they did a backward stepwise logistic regression where they looked for several different variables, clinical, ECG, and echo. And they ended up with 13 variables that ended up being significant in producing a strong multivariate model. And so with this, eight of them were clinical, uh, four of which were ECG, and one was echo. And they developed this uh, point score system. So when they, when they modeled this, and this is from their internal validation aspect of the study, the, all three things together gave uh, ROC of 8.808. And then when they did this in an external validation, it was at 0.782, and that was in the Ventura Presto study. So in summary, sudden cardiac death remains a large public health burden. And the current risk ratification strategies we have are inadequate for allocating ICDs. Um, improving risk ratification, I think, will need to utilize strategies that have, one, identify a rhythmic substrate, two, have comprehensive risk models, that, risk models that use data from multiple sources, and then we need to optimize these models using novel tools such as AI deep learning. Um, and eventually, we'll need prospective studies testing these strategies as an SCD screening tool and potential indicator for ICDs. So, thank you. Great talk, Sumit. So practical question. Patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy with EF more than 35%, are there any markers based on EKG or MRI or anything that you, know, you guys or EP is using currently uh, in terms of risk prediction and implanting an ICD? Yeah, so I'd say right now the main thing is going to be if they fall within that must trial inclusion criteria. If they're in that sort of mid-range, you have 35 to 40 percent, they can get an EP study and potentially qualify for an ICD. Um, in terms of the data, probably the thing that was most mm -hmm. impressive to me was really that genomic study where they looked at more of those mid-range EFs broadly, 35 to up to 50 percent implied it, and that's where they really saw um, a significant drop, uh, a significant difference. Um, but other than that, it's it's still kind of mostly secondary prevention ICDs. We can you know enhance their risk with things like cardiac MRI and looking at LGE, but in terms of the guidelines, it's not very clear cut that we can actually implant an ICD unless it's becoming for secondary. I have more, more comments than questions. Great <laughs> job at summarizing a very difficult topic. And the problem here is that um, sudden death is a functional event, and you're trying to predict a, a kind of random functional event that can happen based on <coughs> structural data. And you know you may you're bound to find associations between low EF or structural markers like uh, scar tissue on the MRI and whatnot that are very non-specific for sudden death and just identify sick people. And and then when it comes to validating any score, uh, sure you can you can show association between any score and the incidence of sudden death. But what the clinician needs, as Sachin was alluding, is do I need to implant an ICD or not? And that requires another clinical trial to, yeah. to validate that you improve survival in patients than to implant an ICD. And implanting an ICD generates some mortality. We know that from, from <coughs> data post-MI. So post-MI, um, we know the highest risk of sudden death is the first month. But we know that implanting immediately actually doesn't improve survival because you may prevent sudden death, but you create more morbidity and mortality uh, by the implant. So we don't implant in the first month. So it's a very challenging issue, and I think the, it, the, it's really ripe for, for uh, new approaches like AI where you take massive amounts of data, not just the EKG. I think the EKG, sure, you can get a publication showing association between the EKG, 
and, and Sarendeth, I don't think is ever going to pan out as a clinically useful tool. But if you add to that uh, genomics and, and even MRI data, um, maybe you can improve it. But still, everything has to be validated against the idea that an ICD would make a difference. Otherwise, who cares, right? Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Long, long, <laughs> long discussion. No. No, thank you. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think it's that's that's what it all comes down to is, you know, are we going to be able to put an ICD in based on this? And it's going to be controversial, I think, for a while um, until we have really, really robust uh, RCT data. If you actually get implanted in many, too many ICDs. Yeah, yeah. So what, more basic than this, and, you know, when sudden death happens, you know, the you know we know that, you know, defibrillation and CPR has been, you know, one of the most important things uh, that, you know, saves lives. So is there, has there been any uh, push towards, I know in Europe, you know, they, they did this, there was a randomized study or I, I, there was some New England Journal publication looking at, uh, you know, bystander CPR and, uh, and uh, you know, portable ICDs. Are, is there a push in the United States to having more of these uh, yeah. portable ICDs and also increasing education in terms of CPR? Because in, in my mind, that is one of the most important things that could potentially save lives beyond uh, and above all this AI algorithms. No, I completely agree. If you look at w the setting in which most sudden cardiac deaths happen, it's actually at home. The vast majority happen at home. Um, and there was actually a trial, I think back in like 2008, like the home AED trial, where they basically had this community where they put all these AEDs in their homes and tried to see if that made a significant difference in sudden cardiac death event rates. And it was a negative trial. Um, and so it, it, the idea kind of um, you know, went away after that for a little while, but there's been some of this resurgence that if we improve education about how to properly use an AD, um, because a lot, there was actually in that trial very low utilization rates of the AD uh, in the patients who did receive it. So it wasn't even, you know, really properly assessed in, in some ways. But I think revisiting that concept, um, potentially putting into community and really educating and making sure that they make good use of the AD, it could make a huge difference. All right, any other questions? If not, great job. Thank you very much. Thank you.